Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. More questions being raised about rehabilitation work at Cornwall Regional Hospital. Body of missing land surveyor found in Manchester. And later in sports, Reggae Boys head coach labels two friendly matches as success. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shamela Pullen. Here are the details. The Cornwall Regional Hospital Rehabilitation Project is now in its third phase, but there were several questions to answer at Wednesday's Public Administration and Appropriations Committee, PAAC, about the procurement process for the final leg of the project. Rehabilitation work at Cornwall Regional Hospital in St. James is now in its third and final phase. The work is expected to begin on October 16 this year and should be completed in March 2026. The contractor has now taken ownership of the site and preliminary work started. There is a component of that contract that also sees for the equipping and oper operationalization of the facility. So we have added the, the remit of providing equipment to the contractor's contract. So no, go again. That, that the equipment will be provided by the contractor as well. By the contract? By the contractor. What the face. kind of equipment? So all the seen. equipment for the hospital. Oh, for the hospital itself? Yeah, all the equipment. And which company is doing this phase three? Um, ZD um, Construction. But PAAC Chairman Mikhail Phillips wanted to know why the construction company was the only company used and why the Minister of Health went to direct procurement and not public tender. Permanent Secretary in the Minister of Health, Dunstan Bryan, responded. Instead of having to go to market, find a design firm, acquire that design firm, have the firm design and then go to market for the, consult the contractor, we just put everything in one contract, design and build. So it would be one procurement process. That decision alone saved us over 36 months in procurement. And still not satisfied, Mr. Phillips quizzed Mr. Bryan about the permission for the approval of directing contracting. No, there's no, no requirement in there's law. There's no requirement? There's no. The only, under Section 25 of the Public Procurement Law, the decision for direct contracting is the sole responsibility of the head of entity. Okay. And therefore, that decision rested on my humble shoulders. And I believe that given its policy implications of an estimated $15 billion, I sought the concurrence of cabinet. Because as the accounting officer in the ministry, I thought from a policy perspective, the chief policy organ of state should be consulted on such an investment. In the end, they were satisfied with Mr. Bryan's responses. Concerns are again being raised about the operations of the Jamaica Urban Transit Company, JUTC. The issue was in the spotlight during Wednesday's sitting of the Parliament's Public Administration and Appropriations Committee, PAAC. The reduction of the fears to deal with the matter of inflation and to reduce the fears at a time when you don't have buses Hence, we're seeing where passengers are now waiting hours because of the reduced fare, and we don't have the buses to carry them. Subsidizing the JUTC in the region of anywhere between 8 to $10 billion average on an annual basis with a loss of $10 billion. I've been preaching and begging, even though we're acquiring 100 more buses no there has to be a look at the operation of JUTC in response prominent secretary in the transport minister Carl Palmer says there is a plan to fix the problem there is quite a bit of work and it's going to take us a little time and so we're asking you PAAC the parliament of Jamaica and our people all to bear with us a little, Minister has given a six-month window to bring in the 100 buses and we're making sure that we deliver on that time. And we will come forth with a proper plan. Maybe that will also include 
an assessment evaluation of JUTC. The Clarendon police are investigating the death of two women in Brandon Hill in the parish. According to reports, the partially decomposed body of 76-year-old Sylvia Smith, a retired teacher, and 38-year-old Natalie Larmond were found by residents about 6 o'clock Wednesday evening. It's understood that Ms. Smith and her daughter Larmond both have mental health issues and live together in a two-bedroom concrete house. Residents say both women were not seen or heard from since Monday, January 29. Citizens became concerned and went to their house. They told our news team that a foul odor was coming from their house. The police were subsequently called. Okay. So when you heard that they died, what came to your mind? We can't believe. I couldn't believe. I couldn't believe. I couldn't believe. I couldn't believe. I left all my work, I have to run cover right when I put my name in my own. I come here to a peer code, I sit down there. Yes. I met you then, then, for two. Trust me. So, right. A pot with what appears to be cooked aki was seen on a stove in the kitchen of which samples were taken for testing. No foul play was suspected. The bodies were removed to the morgue where postmortems are to be done. The body of a man who went missing in Ingleside, Manchester on Monday was found. He has been identified as 52-year-old land surveyor Colin Watt. According to reports, Mr. Watt's body was found in bushes along Tangerine Drive sometime after 4 Wednesday afternoon. Mr. Watt's sister, Kay Watt, says she is not sure how her brother died. I don't think there's any foul play or anything like that. He seemed to have slipped going down into the little ravine. Maybe hit his head or something. I, I'm supposing. Su supposing. It's a little way off the road. He has been under stress for a little time now. And part of the reason why he went to exercise this afternoon, this, um, it's on Monday morning, to release some of the stress. She says it's been difficult for the family. Everybody is de devastated at this point. Um, the whole family has been looking for him from Monday, and that in itself, you can imagine, is very devastating. Now that we have come across the body, it is even harder for us at this point. Meanwhile, the police later revealed that Mr. Watts' body had stab wounds and his death is now being treated as a homicide. The St. Mary Health Department is reporting an improvement in the parish's water quality. Rupert Stevens is the Chief Medical Health Inspector for St. Mary. Speaking at the recent Municipal Corporation monthly meeting, he said a total of seven drinking water supplies were reviewed. Six samples were deemed satisfactory while one was deemed unsatisfactory. A total of five samples were collected from municipal corporation supplies and submitted to the lab for analysis. One of those five samples was deemed bacteriologically unsafe and this supply is the Gilbert Spring. He says an additional 17 residual chlorine checks were conducted of which 14 were deemed satisfactory. Mr. Stevens says the health department will continue to monitor community supplies. What we are doing at the health department is that we continue to educate residents in communities where these community supplies serve. And we try to empower the communities to take greater responsibilities for these supplies in terms of protecting the watershed and keeping the supply areas clean and free from contamination. It's time for a break. Stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. 
Head of the Manchester Police Superintendent Shane McCalla is urging the church to pray for the police in the fight against crime. Speaking at a Manchester Division Church Service and Award Ceremony recently, he called on the church to do its part, noting that there can be no crime plan without divine intervention. The only thing that evil needs to succeed is when you, the righteous, the good men and women, remain silent. I need a church to get up. We need to fast. We need to pray. We need to plead the blood of Jesus. That's what we need from you. He says in order for there to be law and order in the parish, there must be support. Superintendent Makalo highlighted the reduction in murders in the parish as a result of cooperation. Last year, the division recorded a significant reduction in murders coming from 61 to 43. So you can do the maths. In the meantime, a warning to murderers and rapists. We have to make the scammers, the rapists, the murderer. We have to make them know, so listen. Manchester is no good again, and I'll for you, because oh, God. God is the captain of this ship. Custis of Manchester Garfield Green is defending the integrity of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, JCF. This following a report by a local university that the JCF is perceived as corrupt by Jamaicans. He says the report does not reflect the true character of JCF members. I do not think the police are corrupt. And I refuse to accept such a notion. Instead, I choose... And I encourage all of us to focus on the countless selfless acts of bravery and sacrifice that our law enforcement officers exhibit daily. Mr. Green believes the survey is flawed. There are just under 3 million citizens in this country. And a survey sample of approximately 1,000 cannot, cannot be a good representation of the people. If you are going to say that the police are corrupt, show me the evidence. Custis Green pointed to the hundreds of police officers who are promoted each year. Part of their promotion is integrity background checks. And these are the men and women who represent the JCF. Reports are also showing that the Jamaica Constabulary Force is operating at a level we never experienced decades ago. And they are bringing more cases before the courts at which they are successful. It's now time for the Business Minute. Cygnus Capital has been appointed the fund manager for the CARCOM Resilience Fund, CRF. The facility which was launched in Barbados last week is a 100 million US dollar blended finance fund focused on climate resilience and economic sustainability. Cygnus Capital is an alternative investment play in the Caribbean and was chosen manager from a competitive selection process involving a number of candidates. The CARICOM Resilience Fund has been under development since January 2023 with support from USAID. The fund will target six key sectors, renewable energy, clean transport, blue economy, sustainable agriculture, ICT, and financial services. Further afield, Disney is set to begin banning password sharing on its streaming services. It's a move that follows in the footsteps of one of its top competitors, Netflix. In an email to Hulu subscribers Wednesday, the company said it would start limiting sharing accounts outside of your household starting March 14th. Now, Hulu's user agreement along with those for Disney Plus and ESPN Plus explicitly prevent users from impersonating someone else by using their username or password. All three user agreements were last updated on January 25. Now, it's unclear, though, when the password sharing language was added to the agreements for Disney Plus and ESPN Plus. 
And if that's it for the Business Minute, I'm Shane Masters. Time now for the top regional and international stories. In the region, Cuba's government has delayed a planned hike on fuel costs that would have raised prices more than 500 percent. The government had announced the five-fold increase to take effect February 1 as part of a series of measures seeking to cut its budget deficit. According to an economy ministry official, there had been a cybersecurity incident whose origin has been identified as a virus from abroad. The official did not give a new date for the planned increase. On the international scene, concern is mounting for thousands of cattle and sheep stranded off the coast of Western Australia in the middle of a heat wave. Authorities ordered the Israeli-owned ship transporting the live cargo to turn around amid fears it could be targeted by Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. The ship was heading to the Middle East. More than 14,000 sheep and 2,000 cattle are on the ship and are estimated to be worth around 2 million Australian dollars. Authorities say the animals will remain on board while the Australian government determine what to do with the shipment. And all 27 EU leaders have agreed on a $50 billion aid package for Ukraine after Hungary had previously blocked the deal. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky welcomed the new funding, saying it would strengthen the country's economic and financial stability. Ukraine's economic ministry says it expects the first tranche of the funds in March. And those are the top regional and international stories. I'm Karian Simpson. We head to a quick break. When we come back, we'll have your midday sports report with Spencer Darlington.